All right, welcome back. Hope you enjoyed your meal. So we're going to move into our next panel entitled Cyber 5G Critical Infrastructure and Battlefield Threats. And uh, I'm going to hand it over to, uh, for the introductions to, <laughs> let's get the, our full uh, biography here. So Grant McDonald from uh, KPMG, he's our, uh, currently the global leader for defense and aerospace with KPMG. Uh, a, new, a new position, actually, congratulations. And um, partner with, uh, with the company as well. And KPMG has been uh, uh, with us as a strategic sponsor for many years now. We're really happy to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Yuri, uh, and good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to the Cyber 5G Critical Infrastructure and Battlefield Threats. It's really a pleasure for me to convene this uh, particular session. Uh, as Yuri mentioned, I now have the role of Global Aerospace and Defense Leader for KPMG, uh, and certainly cyber security and 5G are two areas of technology that uh, we're focused on uh, within our platform known as Connected Defense Enterprise. Um, and, and in that, we advise industry and government clients, uh, both within Canada and around the world. Of course, there's many other transformative uh, technologies uh, such as IoT, cloud, big data, quantum, IA, and robotics, just to name a few. Uh, and our approach with respect to those is to uh, work with both our global and our local uh, technology alliance partners to, uh, to achieve uh, client outcomes. So many of the speakers over the last day and a half, uh, including the CDS and the Deputy Minister yesterday, uh, did reference non-traditional threats such as cyber attacks, uh, including those sanctioned by foreign states, China and others. Um, and this is now such a pervasive issue that certainly Five Eyes and other countries are taking very specific actions to protect themselves. Um, for example, this morning, uh, Under Secretary Lord uh, did mention what D DOD is implementing in the U.S. And this is something that we're following very closely, being the uh, cybersecurity uh, certification requirements that the uh, defense industrial base uh, will need to apply to uh, protect the military supply chain. So that's, that's a very important issue. Uh, but our previous panels uh, also referenced the need to understand and harness the new technologies such as 5G to help deliver on the desired military objectives. Uh, and I think the speed, the latency, uh, and the, the ability to support millions of connections does make 5G uh, revolutionary. Um, but as we know, based on uh, the Huawei debate and other issues, uh, it's not without risk. So it's really within uh, this context that I'm pleased to introduce our panel and moderator today. And while I'm introducing them, why don't you join me on stage, and I will read your bios as you come up and uh, take a seat at the podium here. Bob and team, do you want to come up? So I'm pleased to introduce first uh, Bob Fife. I think people know Bob very well, the uh, Bureau Chief for the Globe and Mail, and Bob will be moderating the, uh, the session today. And along with Bob, we really do have an esteemed panel. I'll speak to them in or the order in which they're sitting. Um, so Dr. Shu Jane Thompson, to the right of uh, Bob, is currently the Vice President and uh, Partner for Global Security, Strategy and Growth at IBM. Now, prior to that, uh, she led cybersecurity and biometrics uh, at IBM, and that followed a very successful career at Lockheed Martin and in the world of academia. Beside uh, Dr. Thompson uh, is retired Rear Admiral Dwight Shepard. Uh, his most recent position was as the Director of Cyberspace Operations for the U.S. Northern Command in NORAD. Uh, but Admiral Shepard is a highly decorated military officer. Uh, he had many operational command and uh, shore tours uh, over a 30-year career with the, uh, with the military in the U.S. And finally, to his right, is Dr. Didier Denay. And uh, Dr. Denay is the director in the uh, Master of Science program uh, on cyber defense at the Military Academy of St. Cyr. That is in France. And for those of you that didn't know, um, that particular academy was founded by uh, none other than Napoleon Bonaparte in 1803. Um, I don't think they were teaching cyber or 5G at that time. Um, so we have a very esteemed panel from the U.S. and France, uh, moderated by Bob Fife from here in Canada. Over to you, Bob. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for showing up here. Um, 
we are under a, a fairly tight schedule, so I'm going to move uh, pretty quickly. But um, what I we're we're going to open opening statements from each of the panelists, and then I'll ask some questions. We are going to take some uh, questions from the audience, which I think is uh, a really good. Uh, way of getting feedback. I'm supposed to be able to get questions off of this tabloid, and if I'm incapable of figuring out how to do that, you can go to the mics. Um, so, Ms. Thompson, can you start, please, with it? Well, excellent. Well, good afternoon, and uh, I wish I could speak in French, but I can't, so I'm just going to stick with uh, English. And I always tell people, before I came to this country, I don't have any accent, so if you don't understand me, by all means, let me know. I will try to uh, say that again, and if you're still not able to understand me, I'm going to exercise a different language. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, I was here yesterday, and really, truthfully, you know, yesterday and today, the discussion was so vigorous, and I cannot be more delighted to hear we really see cyber as a problem. It's no longer just an IT problem. I think you would agree with me. If we all think that cyber is an IT problem, we are in big trouble. And also, what I was very intrigued by that here is how important it is. We now see the importance of marrying the information operation, the intelligence operation, the war fighting with our cyber operation. And this is really is what we put operation in the center of what we do. And I'm a technologist. However, I'm going to tell you that is technology is the last thing in your equation. And I always tell folks here is that cyber is a team sport. It really requires all of us to work together, and you're only strong as your weakest link. And so today we're going to talk about 5Gs. And many of you guys probably are the champion for 5G, are ready to deploy 5Gs. And many of the technologists on this panel are also going to tell you 5G is ready. But then the question here is, are we ready? And I think we've got to really think about how you deploy 5G that you are not leaving behind the 4Gs and other legacy application, and also our end users. Are they ready to use 5G capabilities? Are you secure in your 5G environment? Now you are pushing the computing off to the edge. Are we ready to secure the entire ecosystem? And let alone, now we talk about cloud. Secure hybrid cloud sounded really dainty. How do we make sure that when we move over to the multi-cloud environment, when that logical domain has been changed, how you secure that? And so this morning, also very exciting to hear, and I saw the two uh, you know, young cadets on the call here, uh, on the, in the stadium here, is that it's really important we need people. People has to be in the center of cyber operation. And this is why we need to make sure that we have diversified the cyber resources so we not only have IT specialists like myself, we need folks who are lawyers. We need folks who understand healthcare. We need folks who understand military operation. So then we can really put that fusion center of cyber operation all together from cyber hygiene implementation to cyber intelligence capability and really achieve that cyber resilience. So I look forward to our conversation. Okay, Mr. Shepard. Thank you all. Uh, thank you for inviting me up here uh, to be on this panel and good afternoon. Uh, this is my first time coming to the Ottawa uh, conference, and hopefully I can invite to come back next year, too. Uh, I love Ottawa. Uh, a little cold, but that's okay. Uh, I, I'll put up with that. Um, so, so let me for a second just put on my J6 hat again out of NORAD NORTHCOM for a second. When you're talking about defense and security, right, so when you're thinking about how we secure and how we defend the domains, Right, air, sea, space. We set up at the borders for maritime and for the land, and we look at the threat vector, and we set up defenses to, uh, to combat the threat. That's coming in from a Pacific vector, either from land, sea, or space. Um, with cyberspace, it's a little different. Uh, cyberspace is literally 360 degrees and moving at the speed of light. And, oh, by the way, the threat is already here. So externally and internally, you have the cyber threat. Because truthfully, everybody could be a threat in cyberspace if you got a smartphone, or a laptop, or a computer. So, so we have to think differently on how we defend in cyberspace, right? So when we build our architectures, our networks, we have to build security into the network. We have to build security into the architecture. And then we have to build security into the devices 
that are going to be running on that architecture, right, in, in both software and hardware. And then we got to defend and build security into the apps that's going to be running on the devices that's going to be running on the networks. So we got to think holistically about defense of cyberspace and our networks. Also, the biggest piece that we have to figure, get our hands around is the people part. And that's kind of what uh, Jane was kind of alluding to is 80 to 90 percent of our compromises is because of people doing <laughs> bad things. And not on purpose, clicking on a bad link, you know, going to an unauthorized website. And then some of it is malicious, but for the most part, uh, it's just uh, uh, mistakes because the criminals are getting so much smarter. So when you think about that threat, you're looking at not only just nation states, but rogue nations, criminal organizations, organized crime, um, terrorists, uh, ter state-sponsored terrorism, and then just anybody that's at home and just want to do something bad because they can with their computers and their laptops. And we gotta, we gotta deal with that piece too. So, so the threat is all around us. The threat is everywhere. And I would argue that my personal information is just as valuable to me as classified material is to the Defense Department, right? We have more, we have more, um, we have more um, uh, personal information on our devices now than we have in our burn, in our fireproof safes. Everything that we do now is part of cyberspace. This is how we live our lives now on these devices. Pay our bills, we bank, we do everything on this. So we gotta just think differently on how we defend and how we secure our networks and our lives, basically, because like she said, if you're just thinking about it as an IT, then you're sort of missing the point because cyberspace is into everything. Literally, it is in everything. And I'm standing by for your questions. Mr. Dene. Uh, je ferai le préambule en français parce que uh, j'ai entendu les élèves officiers ce matin du Collège de Saint-Jean <laughs> qui s'inquiétaient du fait qu'il n'y ait qu'un seul intervenant français par rapport à tous les autres intervenants, donc je voulais leur dire, peut-être ça va leur redonner la foi, que je suis un deuxième intervenant français. Euh, et j'ai bien compris qu'il y avait euh, cette question de la langue qui était importante. Voilà. Donc je voulais simplement remercier les organisateurs de m'avoir invité, parce que c'est la première fois que je viens, et c'est véritablement un, un, une conférence extrêmement enrichissante, avec beaucoup d'échanges tout à fait passionnants. Et je voulais aussi remercier l'ambassade de France et l'Union européenne qui ont pris en charge mon, mon déplacement, ma mission, ce qui n'était pas une mince affaire puisque ça s'est fait de manière un petit peu rapide. Voilà. Donc je vais repasser à l'anglais maintenant, euh, qui est une langue que je maîtrise beaucoup moins bien malheureusement, pas comme les Canadiens qui parlent aussi bien l'anglais que le français. Moi, mon anglais est quand même très 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 limité. So, uh, as far as cyber uh, defense is concerned, I'm in, in a special position uh, here because. Uh, for, for many reasons, the first one is that I'm a French uh, scientist and uh, I think that we don't have the same point of view uh, than the point of view of our uh, US colleagues or Canadian colleagues. I think that there may be what I'm going to say may be quite different from what we've heard uh, yesterday and this morning. Uh, the second idea is that I'm a social scientist. I am not a technologist. I know nothing about the techniques. Uh, but I try to understand uh, cyber uh, conflict from the social point of view, the so social point, scientist point of view, and I'm happy to, to hear that uh, the social aspect of cyber defense is recognized by eminent uh, technologists as a key point, which is, I think, a key point. And the third uh, thing which is uh, specific with my uh, presentation is that I am uh, the head of a um, training program, which is very specific because most of training programs in cyber defense, uh, especially for senior officers, are dedicated to technical uh, aspects of cyber defense. We're training uh, a great number of uh, French officers in engineers school in order to master the technical part of um, the cyber space 
and they are working a lot on information security, uh, information system security. Uh, the French MOD asked us in Saint Cyr to conceive a different training program in order to train senior officers uh, to integrate uh, cyber dimension in the operations with the idea that cyber is a necessary component of each and every uh, military operation nowadays and you can't do without cyber space and cyber uh, tools. But you need to perfectly integrate the cyber dimension in the military operation because if you don't do that, you've got on the one side the uh, engineers who are dealing with a very technical thing and on the other you've got the ordinary military officers who don't understand what the others do and it's very complicated to, uh, to, to know uh, what are the opportunities and what are the threats. If you don't understand the techniques and if you separate the uh, signal core people and the others, you, you've got a split between the two and it's very dangerous. So our mission is to train officers who are able to understand the basics of the technology because if you understand nothing, it's a bit problematic. So they are, we are trying to train them to understand the basics of the technology, to understand the language, to understand the, the, the main things. And then they are able to integrate these information into the planification and the uh, implementation of operations. And so uh, we are uh, currently training these officers for the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, and even for uh, a certain number of foreign countries who are sending officers in the master. So my point of view is this one. It's not a technical point of view, it's really the point of view of the social scientist who is concerned with the uh, understanding the techniques in order to use it in a proper way and also understanding the fact that cyber is not just technology, it's also social uh, networks, it's, social, it's also influence, it's also propaganda. And we're obviously uh, working on these uh, topics in saint -Cyr. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Robert Hannigan, the former uh, director of British Signal Intelligence, said there are two uh, trends that he finds quite alarming. One is the rise in the volume of attacks, and the other is the rise in the sophistication of the attacks. And uh, the first one, um, there are about at least a million malware uh, attacks every day against uh, corporations and governments, but then there's the the one uh, of state actors where they're out to steal technology, state secrets, trade secrets, um, and it's gone to the point where it's gone, it, they're actually attacking the internet infrastructure itself, Reuters and, Reuters and switches, and he thinks that uh, the West is losing this cybersecurity battle right now, and I'd, I'd like to get uh, input from um, all three of you on whether you think he's right. One from a, a point of view from the private sector, one from somebody who's had a great deal of experience in a senior role in the, in the US military, and somebody from a European perspective on, on whether you think we are winning or losing this. And we'll start with you, Ms. Thompson. Okay. Well, ladies first. Um, so, it, it, are we losing the battle? Um, I think I'll ask the question differently. Are we winning the battle? And what does winning the battle really mean? Uh, many of you guys probably have you know, experienced similar challenges with many of our clients. Is when you go up to the CEOs and COO asking for cyber funding, what did they tell you? Can we cut into half, right? It's very hard to build the business case for cybersecurity, very similar. Are we winning the battle? Are we losing the battle? Because in cybersecurity, Sue Jen's opinion here is that it's a consequence. It's a consequence management. Because if there's no attack, we assume there's no attack. It's matters that you know it's been attacked or not. It's, it's, not, it's matters of time. It's matters of when you discover that. But the consequence is the damage. Do you know what's the current damage, uh, uh, financial uh, impact for a data breach? Each data breach, $3.8 million per data breach. And that's the business case that we are talking about. Are we winning the battle? This is usually what I would ask the client, is to look at, in their enterprise, are they really having a cohesive and you know, business mission adequate security posture? 
Do you know what your threat vectors are? Do you know what your attack surfaces are? Especially today, many of us are moving over to the edge computing or the cloud computing. And that logical security domain had changed because you're not the only player anymore. You have your service providers. All together are defending and protecting your ecosystem of your security posture. How do we measure that? How do you measure that success? And knowing that are we winning the battle or not, right? So a couple of things people ask me saying, how do you measure cyber successes? I say it's very important. You measure yourself by how many, you know, same attack that you actually let the attack to win the battle. You know, they attack you by sending you the same ransomware and you, you know, your same system got affected. That to me is a big backdoor right there. So to me, I, I talk about cyber hygiene, cyber intelligence, then cyber resilience. If you don't do your hygiene, then you are not gonna receive that resiliency, meaning you will continue to operate even when you are under attack. And so to me, you know, in the West country, uh, are we winning or are we losing the battle? I think there's winning and, lo and losing battles in terms of uh, the different play. Yesterday I heard uh, our uh, Department of Defense folks talk about, you know, we no longer stay in the defensive side because we spend so much time and energy investing in the defensive side. We are now trying to do the counter-offensive and offensive side of the house. I think there is a very important balance act right there because we need to be able to build a fault to you know, to keep your cyber hygiene intact. And that's including people, process, and technology. And then we need to have insight to be able to predict what the threat vectors are, the index, the threat index. So many of you, I can ask you, do you know what your threat index for your enterprise? Do you know, are you, is your threat index higher than normal? And what is your current state? It is the importance of having that visibility of your threat index. And also the next question here is, do you know your neighbors, your, you know, the next logical domain that work very closely with your domain, what's their threat index? I mean, the cyber, I said, is a team sport. It's no longer just we play along. So I'm delighted to hear we are looking at alliances. We are looking at how we be able to expand a virtual domain so we can work together and share the threat insights. And there are technology allowing us to do that. And I would hope that we can you know, think forward in terms of not just winning the battle, but also as we go, yesterday we talked about sunrise and sunset of technology. When we are adopting the emerging technology such as blockchain, quantum computing, let's think about from the firmware, from the motherboard, all the way to the software and the process, we secure every layer, and I call that think security first, secure by design, and that would really help us to win the battle. I think that the battle is gonna continue, and this asymmetry game, uh, gaming in the cybersecurity, require all of us to really do the smart investment and to make sure that we raise that you know, common denominator of our people. Because I can tell you the biggest uh, you know, weaknesses that I have frequently observed is people. It's because people don't understand what they did is not secure. And this is, will be something that would be good as a fundamental thing that we do. And so I'm delighted you talk about training here. I mean, the training here is not just train our IT people. We gotta train our COO, we gotta train our financial people, we gotta train our contracting people. Uh, this morning we talked about acquisition. I think it is important, the terms and conditions sets in the contract. Uh, documentation, the guiding the contractor like us to provide better services, all of those need to put in place to be able to really fight the battle and win the battle. So I don't think I answered your question, but I went a long way. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Mr. Shepard. So, so I agree with everything that Dr. Thompson said. So winning and losing. Hmm. Um, so, so I look at it from two perspectives. So from, I'm also uh, a Samsung consultant. So, uh, uh, for their global uh, BDG, I'm one of their uh, primary consultants. Um, and we're getting in the industry, we're probably getting a million scans and probes a day against our industry networks compared to the Defense Department and government where we're getting 30, 40 million scans and probes a day. So what I used to brief, uh, and, and why is there so many going to the Defense Department and the government? Uh, where well, they think that that's where the secret's at, right? So, so why do people rob banks? Well, because that's where the money's at, right? So, so they're going after the Defense Department for the most part. So when I used to brief the commander uh, of uh, NORAD, 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 NORTHCOM, 
was because he would ask me every morning, are we secure? And I'm like, sir, we're as secure as we can be until we are not. <laughs> and we are not could be a click of a link. Because you click on one bad link, again, it goes back to uh, hygiene, you click on one bad link and it bypasses all my firewalls. And it's right there now in my system. So now I need some sort of host-based security system that can detect the threat uh, isolate the threat and then mitigate the threat. So winning or losing, um, I, I'm not sure that I, I can phrase it that way. On the, on the, on the um, uh, industry side, there's a lot of good things coming out of it because it forces us now to innovate and change and spiral technology and get better and better every day. So it forces us uh, to get better uh, and come up with new ways to defend and new ways to secure and new ways to, des to design because I think it's what uh, uh, Dr. Thompson was kind of getting to. We have to design uh, both on manpower and both on industry piece. So, so I would say today that we're probably winning if I had just had to twist my arm and say one or the other. Um, but again, we're one click away from losing. So we just got to stay vigilant and stay thing. But we are no doubt, in my opinion, we're in phase two or phase three of warfare, so in cyberspace. So there's no doubt in my mind that right now we are in a cyberspace war uh, with the adversaries, and there's a lot of them right in there everywhere. So. Uh, maybe I, I'm quite a bit more optimistic than, than you, uh, <laughs> because if we, if, if we return a few years ago, the, the, the great fear in the beginning of the 21st century was the cyber Pearl Harbor or the cyber Chernobyl, which was the hypothesis uh, of a cr complete crash of our systems, uh, our critical infrastructures with uh, atomic uh, explosions and industrial catastrophes, etc. Et uh, why? Because at this time, we were thinking that uh, in cyberspace, a very weak attacker was very powerful and may endanger uh, industrial systems, etc., etc. And so at this time, we were thinking about how a, a, a guy uh, who was alone in his, uh, just in the movies, uh, just like in the movies, uh, how a, a guy who was alone with a, a tiny computer was able to destroy uh, military systems, etc., etc. This fear now, I think, is, uh, is away. We don't think that because uh, we've made a lot of progress. Our engineers made a lot of uh, progress in terms of security of systems. I think that our systems are now much more secure than they were 20 uh, years ago. Uh, we are going to benefit from new technologies. I think that our intelli artificial intelligence will help us in the treatment of most of uh, attacks which are basic attacks. If your system is update, you, you fear nothing because your antivirus is going to treat the, the, the attack. But I think that there are two, uh, two risks, two, two, two reasons which uh, could make me pessimistic. The first one is the fact that cert, a cert, uh, small number of attacks are really sophisticated with people who are really clever, who benefit from the uh, resources of state and a state with real uh, capabilities in cyberspace. This is the first thing we may fear. There's a very small number of sophisticated attacks by state-sponsored attackers. And the second thing is, uh, what is the second thing? <laughs> uh, which makes me pessimistic. Uh, Oh, I've forgotten the second one, but it was, I think it was very important. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> uh, I forgot. Well, you, may it will you may come back to it. So yeah. um, we heard from General Vance yesterday. His, his big, he talked about uh, the threat of Russia, but he said in t when it comes to cybersecurity, it, it's China that uh, is uh, his biggest worry. And yesterday at the uh, Senate Judiciary Committee, the Assistant uh, Deputy f of the FBI, Clyde Wallace, said that the, from the American perspective, it's China as well because they have a, a government whole approach to cyber. 
And, and I would be interested in the panelists telling the audience, what's the difference between how China um, approaches cyber warfare or uh, its attempts to uh, obtain technology or secrets compared to how the Russia Russians behave because they're, I think those, I mean, we know Iran and North Korea and, and other countries are involved in this, but they're really the, the two bigger, biggest players, uh, I would assume, along with the United States. Um, so I'd be very curious to, to get your input on, on that, whoever wants to speak up. Uh, maybe this, this was my second point. <laughs> 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 the second point which, which made me uh, quite pessimistic is the fact that the battlefield, the, the, the threat is changing. Uh, the threat was mostly technical a few years ago, and now I think that the threat is not mostly technical, but it's a hybrid threat in relation with Russia, for example, because uh, cyberspace is a field of operations uh, towered uh, populations and armed forces. And we see that one of the threats we have to deal with today is the propaganda or the influence of our operations, which are now coming from Russia on a very sophisticated level. We, we can see that we've got some uh, specific units in the armored forces who are targeted by campaigns uh, quite clever mixing social networks, mixing um, uh, ordinary um, newspaper, uh, etc., etc. And so this threat is very complicated to, to deal with because um, it's not a technical threat. We don't know, uh, there is not some kind of malware we have to identify in the code, etc. But uh, we've got some psychological operations that we need to, to take care of because uh, we've seen that in some, we, we have testimonies by uh, some units in which this kind of influence is not, is quite significant. So this is a, a second reason for my pessimistic uh, point of view. And so just to, to go further, uh, the difference I can say between China and Russia is that, as far as we can know it, uh, Russians are really conceiving a military operation uh, based on cyberspace uh, features, uh, whereas uh, we don't have the same with China. With China, we certainly have uh, spying problems, etc. but uh, really the, the military operation that we can see in Ukraine, in Georgia, uh, are Russian operations not Chinese operations. Anybody else? So, um, between Russia and China, uh, uh, so, uh, two points. One is, um, I think we got a pretty good idea how Russia works, right? Mm -hmm. We've been doing the Cold War with Russia for as long as I've been alive, and certainly uh, the bulk of my military career was part of the Cold War. So I would, say, I would say that we probably have a better understanding of Russia and Russia's TTPs and that kind of thing, uh, tactics and, and procedures. And Russia tend to be more hardware-based. Uh, I think China may be, a, it's just my opinion, but I think China may be a little bit more sophisticated on the technological side. And I think they're pursuing technology maybe a little faster than Russia's mm -hmm. pursuing technology. So I would, uh, I would agree that I think that China's probably our biggest technological threat right now in cyberspace uh, than, than more so Russia. Um, so. Well, my opinion here is that I think China has the levers, you know, their levers are much more complicated compared to Russia from my very limited knowledge uh, in terms of their financial uh, inferences because lots of manufacturers uh, the source of the manufacturer is in China. They also own quite a bit of uh, financial debt from other countries. Uh, you know, so I think that that's their lever. They can make it very complex. Both Russia and China are very yeah. aggressive. We all know that. That's why we think they are big threats. However, I think if you look at the cyber attack, a very high percentage of the cyber attack is done by organized crime. And those organized crime may be backed by some national security interests, but they are also buried by many of the interests financially or any other you know, obnoxious intent. And so to me, in the private sector, uh, is China more threatening than, than, uh, than Russia? I think if you look at just the supply chain, downstream supply chain concern, 
Absolutely, because every chip component is produced outside of the Canada and, 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 and US majority of them are like that. For us to maintain the integrity of those parts and components, specifically in the electronic components, become very difficult. I can ask you, uh, do, are you monitoring your voltage and wattage fluctuation in your major devices? Because that's probably one of the few ways you can really see the firmware levels of attack, right? So, but most of us are not quite doing that. And this is why that's the threat that we're presenting to ourselves. Another item is we all talk about the so-called supply chain integrity. Meaning that chip produced at you know somewhere in you know in South America may have in route through many different you know stops. And during those periods of transportation, the integrity of your component could be modified. And this is where it's quite important for us to really be able to assure from the source to the destination that the integrity of your components really maintain their integrity. And many of the applications we use is use blockchain. And about three years ago, I still remember I carried a conversation with some of our uh, customer about secure the blockchain. And they look at me like, are you crazy? Blockchain is secure. How many of you can believe in uh, blockchain is secure? So there is a, <laughs> there's a, a major debate going on uh, amongst the Five Eyes community, but also in Europe. The Americans are pressing the French and the Germans as well as uh, um, uh, the Five Eyes allies to um, not to to ban uh, Huawei from 5G. I mean, 5G is going to change the whole way we deal with in the in the in the uh, with our with. That's a new form of technology that's going to be very fast. It's going to change everything that we do. Um, and the Americans are very concerned that by allowing uh, Huawei into 5G that it's going to give the Chinese an opportunity just to suck up everything if they, if they want. Um, and I, I want to ask, um, perhaps I'll start with you, Mr. Shepard. Um, what do you think of the British decision that they've decided to limit it to 35% of their market, keep it out of the core, and keep it out of sensitive areas? Um, the Americans and the Australians argue that in the 5G world, that's not it's impossible to do that. Uh, and I'm, I, and this is a debate we're having here in Canada on whether this is possible too. So maybe I can start with you. Hmm. So, so uh, I can't speak on the UK's decision on uh, how they divided up the uh, uh, allowing Huawei to participate. Uh, obviously, that was a political decision made by the country. So I don't have any access to what drove that and what didn't drive it or what drove that, uh, uh, that uh, determination. So by no means do I want to speak for the UK. Um, but what I will say is, is kind of what uh, 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 Dr. Thompson was alluding to is, do you understand your supply chain? Do you have a secure supply chain? Um, 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 I don't know if you know it, but one of the biggest chip makers now is Samsung. Samsung, uh, we have a secure supply chain. We make our own chips all the way down to the devices. We're not gonna find any Chinese components in any of the Samsung uh, Android uh, devices. So you have to be tactical on how you wanna, so let me just, let me just step back to, because you owe your citizens, a, you owe your citizens in your country some semblance of protection. So you have to determine as a country, as a defense department, as a government, um, where is your threat vector coming from? And if that company is part of the threat vector, then you owe it to yourself and you owe it to your, cit your citizens to protect them and their personal information. And I'll get your point of view. And I also note that France's biggest telecom has said no to Huawei. Ah, um, I, I would say first that I'm not speaking for the EU or for the French government. It's personal opinion. <laughs> uh, because I, I think that there, there is uh, quite an understand, uh, poor understanding of the European position on Huawei uh, on the side of the Atlantic. Uh, as far as I've... I've heard a lot of things about the, the, the European 
uh, union position, which are not true, in fact. Uh, what did we, I say we for European Union, what did we decide, in fact? Uh, we decided not to ban Huawei. Uh, and the uh, toolbox, which was uh, issued in January, last January 2020, just explains that we, European Union will not ban Huawei. But that, that doesn't mean that we trust in Huawei. That means that we trust no one. <laughs> and that each and every provider for 5G networks will have to satisfy to uh, deepen uh, analysis from uh, uh, the, the, the European countries who are going to uh, go to the 5G. So it means that uh, at this time, if, uh, for example, in France, uh, the companies, telecom companies, want to uh, implement a 5G network, uh, they, whatever the, the provider, they have to ask the French administration the authorization to deploy the, uh, the networks. And so the telecom provider needs to uh, explain why, who is uh, the provider, uh, to what extent uh, there, is, there is a mix between different providers. Uh, what part of the systems are going to be um, uh, mastered by such provider, etc., etc. So this means that the admi French administration, the ANSI, the national agency who is dealing with information system security, is going to analyze the, uh, the, the file. And uh, at the end of the examination, the uh, French administration will say yes, no, not like that, you must change this, etc. Et so it means that, in fact, we do not trust in Huawei, we trust no one. Because if a provider asks Nokia or Ericsson or Samsung uh, to build the network, you will have the same obligation to uh, prove that there is no risk uh, for the but isn't, isn't there, we're in a different world here where Huawei is not a publicly traded company. Yeah. Um, we have a Chinese law mm -hmm. that says that you're obligated to spy for the state if yeah. requested to do so. And there are, and, and you're, you're, you're probably a, an expert on this, but we're, there also are people are arguing, uh, certainly the Australian uh, signal intelligence uh, mm -hmm. director has argued that in a 5G world you simply can't test uh, all the time because the software is being continually uh, updated. And so you have yeah. to go with, with providers that you believe are, are secure, yeah. not ones who are, are unsecure. Am I mm -hmm. right on that? It's presenting or? a very large uh, vulnerability, if you will, because when we are moving into the 5Gs, that the scale of testing really exponentially grow, right? Because you're now pushing your computing you know, and your device is out to the age. So it's not a centralized computing anymore. Thanks goodness, today we have 10% of our uh, computing is really you know, operate at the age. I'm sure that uh, Department of Defense may be a higher percentage. But it is predicted by 2025, 75% of the computing is gonna be pushed to the age. That tells us why we need to pay attention on this, whether we should ban in Huawei or a you know, similar so-called malpractice, if you would. Uh, it is really important because you cannot test so, you know, to the degree that give you the assurance. Because I heard that you know, a, the good general says, you know, we do very well on the information assurance. When we go into the age computing, the, you know, the information assurance become very cumbersome. And you know, that assurance become a little weak in my mind. And so the speed, the, the, the velocity, the scale become a challenge. And so to me, you know, demanding the supplier to provide the integrity and assurance of their quality and, and you know, making sure that you know, it's not being used by the uh, malicious intent is critically important. That's a protection of our supply chain line. And this is not just for the, uh, the government, for the, you know, the private sector, it's the same thing. Think about that. You don't want your trade secret, right? to be you know, somehow hijacked because of the device levels of you know, back holes. And so to me, this is where I would say is business conduct 101. Having said that, should we ban them or not? I'm really not in the political side to say so, but I really believe in, you know, it, from, a, from a security perspective here is, 
I think our consumer has right to protect themselves. And we, as a service provider, need to protect our consumer. And I think our government need to have the policy and regulation to reinforce that. Yeah, so, so. My opinion. Yeah, so my opinion as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not speaking for the President of the United States. <laughs> uh, my opinion. Uh, well, you heard uh, Mrs. Uh, Honorable Lord, Ms. Lord, Lord this morning. Uh, we're not allowing Huawei into our defense and government networks in the United States. Um, because what it really boils down to is trust. Do you have trust? And what I would put out for anybody that's in a position of decision making if you have access, if a company is coming in and putting a bid and doing an RFP and you don't have transparency into their code, transparency into their scripts, then you may need to want to look at another company, right? Because trust is going to be what's going to drive decisions. And at the 5G level, because 5G, she talked about the speed, it's going to be 20 times faster than LTE and 4G, and it's going to be a huge pipe. If it's compromised, a whole lot of information is going to be moving somewhere very fast, right? So you got to have trust in who you are dealing with and who you are contracting with. So. Did you want to add? No, it, I think that it's exactly the, uh, the same view in Europe, which means that we obviously do not trust uh, Huawei because of the links between the company. Or, or anybody. But, but, and, uh, but, but, but it's, a, it's uh, an issue that we had to deal with for a very long time. Maybe in, in the, it's this part of the uh, Atlantic Ocean, it's a new problem, but we have the same issue, this, this same issue for a long time. If I, I will really, I don't want to compare what is not comparable. But um, you may know that in France, for example, some uh, people uh, consider that the fact that the Ministry of Defense is working with Microsoft Office and Windows is a danger for the national security. Because maybe Microsoft introduced backdoors in Windows, which is sold to the French Ministry of Defense. So that maybe Microsoft may steal the very secret things in the uh, computers of the Ministry of Defense. And so we had to answer that. We had to answer to these people who wanted to, to ban Microsoft from the Ministry of Defense that, uh, and they were quite strong because there is an alternative. The French gendarmerie is using Open Office instead of Microsoft mm -hmm. Office. Uh, and so we, the, 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 the French Ministry of Defense had to explain that we can trust in Microsoft because we have a specific contract with Microsoft with specific provisions who uh, bring us um, information uh, and who, there, there is a really a dialogue between Microsoft and the French MOD which makes that this solution is better than uh, OpenOffice, you see? But we had to explain that. And it's not, uh, it, it's uh, really something which is going on because a few weeks ago, I don't know if you've noticed that and maybe Google is not very in trouble with that, but the French government decided that the, com the uh, computers of the all French administration must not use Google as a search engine because we've got a very interesting French search engine which is very famous in the world and we replaced Google by this French search engine. So you see, it's a debate which is going on in France. Uh, maybe you, no, nobody knows the name of this French search engine? No, I don't give it because in fact, it's, uh, it's being under an, uh, an, uh, another <laughs> presentation. Uh, but you, you see, it's a debate that we had uh, since a long time. And so the answer is very simple. In fact, some telecom uh, operators uh, and the, uh, the, the ones who are the closest to the French administration banned Huawei, in fact. Orange, for example, which is the uh, major uh, telecom company in France, banned Huawei. They will not use Huawei. They will work with Nokia and Ericsson. And the French administration is probably going to ban Huawei too. So, uh, I think that we, we clearly have a, a problem of trust with the Chinese uh, operator 
And uh, I think that, the, the, in fact, the, the domain of the Huawei in uh, the Western country will be quite limited. Yeah, I want to ask you about that, because do you think that we're entering a world now, uh, if be, because of Huawei, and you've seen it with Google, they're not in China anymore. So are we going to have a world where you have um, a, a liberal democracy infrastructure, network infrastructure and a Chinese one? I mean, is this possible that we're going in that direction? Or is that not possible? Is that a quiz? Yeah, I'm just curious. <laughs> <laughs> Am I going to get any score out of this? Um, I, I see the possibility, but I, I also kind of would challenge that by, you know, can you segregate the East and West domain like that? You know, physically separating the network. I highly doubt. I think that's going to jeopardize the entire world economy. And, you know, truthfully, I, I think technology can do anything. Technology had no nationality, right? I mean, the technology we invented in US, in Canada, in the Western country is widely adopted by, you know, Microsoft is used by all worldwide, right, in all different languages. To me, you know, there is no software is secure, I have to tell you guys, because, you know, as a bad actor, if your full-time job is trying to, you know, bend at your back doors, right, try to find your vulnerability, I'll find that. Right, so this is why security has to be a continual operation, and this is why I keep talking about posture, right? Because that posture change with your logical environment, physical environment changes, your people change, and your business process change. And this is why it requires continuous monitoring and track alert, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, doing your hygiene, such as put the right patch to the Microsoft system, right? Because you know, they will be cooperative, I will hope, and working with you to get the right patch out. And now we, as the owner of the devices, just need to roll out those patches, including those, you know, your dark uh, IT, right? Those are not online, because many, many times what you find in here is you push out all the patches, and guess what? Those ones in you know, the dark IT are not connected to the network. You're not patching them. And the moment they get onto the network, that's your back door right there. And so I'm not answering your question directly, I guess. Yeah, but fine. to me, uh, anything is possible, especially, uh, you know, I actually was just uh, doing a review on a zero trust uh, architecture. And the zero trust architecture was in response to uh, one of the US government uh, initiative and really trying to look into the, the so-called advanced technology, how you build a zero trust network as opposed to in the, in the old time is once you get a key to the door, you, get, you know, everything open up to you. And I think that may be something we need to take into consideration, especially now you're going to have quantum computing. The very powerful computing resources become part of our, you know, our computing resources. And think about encryption, forget about that, it's going out to the door. You need to have new technology, new way to defend your enterprise. So, so is that possible? I would say yes, with time and with the focus investment. Now the question here is can they solve their domestic problem and put that effort to it? I think you know, we all have that same agenda, right? You just cannot do enough. But I do believe in we must, of course I'm cyber, right? We must focus on solving the cyber problem. We must get our, our front door, you know, our guard our front door, meaning get the cyber hygiene in place and really have the ability to predict the threat. You need to outthink the, the bad actors because you know, those organized crime are back up with state of arts business capability. I mean, they have 24 by 7 by 365 support, far better than any other service provider out there. So they have the ability to, you know, go behind us. And so I think this is why I cannot say enough of the importance of push security first. And, and it may sound biased because I'm a security lady, but it is critically important. So, so I, I think you can have a liberal democratic nation and country and, and have a Chinese network. Because uh, there's another piece that goes along with the trust piece, right, that we're competing with, and that's cost. Right, so if you're a poor nation trying to bring your country uh, into, the, uh, uh, into this century with technology, uh, can you afford Samsung? Can yeah, and, and, and Huawei, Huawei is you traditionally afford? underpriced. Yeah. So, so there's another piece to go along with trust, which is cost um, uh, and risk. So the, everybody in uniform, we understand the word risk, right? So we live that every day. 
uh, you balance out risk with cost and with trust. So, but I think you can have both. Well, they even give it for free. <clears throat> so, no. Very little is free. I'm a firm believer that you get what you pay for. <laughs> so I'm a, I'm a firm believer that you get what you pay for. You pay for nothing, you get nothing. So, so, so Mr. Shepard, I want to I ask you because of your role in NORAD. Um, the Americans, uh, and this is a bipartisan consensus. This is not driven by the Trump administration. This is driven by uh, national security agencies in the United States and a bipartisan consensus in the, in the U.S. Congress that Huawei is a threat and that if uh, U.S. allies who depend on the United States for classified intelligence, that if they put Huawei into the 5G network, that there will be consequences in terms of sharing of sensitive intelligence. Um, because you've worked so closely with Canada, uh, and uh, I think Canada is different than, the, than even in the UK, even though it's an important, very important Five uh, Eyes ally, but our, our intelligence networks, our security systems, our military are much more deeply integrated. And would you agree with that? And secondly of all, oh. if, if the Americans were to, uh, to follow through on the threat, what would be the implications to, to Canada? So, so Canadian U.S., we're literally attached at the hip, right? So when you start thinking about, when you start talking about allies, you can't get more allied in Canada than the United States. I mean, we're attached. We're part of North America. What happens in Canada happens in the U.S. What happens in the U.S. happens in Canada. Matter of fact, anything that happens in the U.S. is probably covered over top of Canada. So, I mean, the reality <laughs> is we are, we are attached at the hip. Um, so part of being attached at the hip, I think that we have to, uh, as, a, as, a, as two nations and, and allies, we have to come up with a common sort of strategy on how we're going to approach 5G and how we're going to approach cyber. Um, and if we're not, we're not, we're doing each other a disservice in, in, in doing that, right? So, so uh, as Ms. Lord alluded to uh, this morning, if, if, I mean, if you, if, if you have, I mean, it's hard to share information. NORAD, we do it because we have a NORAD secret system that we use and is not really that secret. And it's really old, so we need to upgrade that too. Um, but, but we have a way we communicate uh, uh, on the classified side and on the unclassified side, unclassified side. Again, it goes back to trust. Does the U.S. trust Canada and Canada systems? Does Canada trust U.S. and U.S. systems? And if we do, we prosper. If we don't, we have a problem because we need each other. We cannot get around the fact that, again, we are attached at the hip. All being said, North America, this is our home. It's a little colder up here, but again, <laughs> it's, it's, this, is, this is home for us. And I think that trust is built upon the agreeable regulation standards, yep. right? Yep. And, uh, and the policies, and I yep. think that is the very key foundation of yep. it. Agree? Agreed. Yep. So um, this is actually not working that well with people sending in questions. So you're better off if people will get to the mics and uh, if you have questions with the panelists. Um, meanwhile, uh, I will, there is one qu question here uh, that I would like to ask. Um, they want to know what type of uh, data should, uh, should, not mi should or should not migrate to the cloud. So. Mm. I'm not sure there's any restrictions that can go to the cloud. <laughs> I mean, when you look at, so here's one of the advantages to cloud technology, right? You can have secure cloud, unsecure cloud. Um, um, and what 5G does, because I want to put this kind of 5G connection to the cloud, right? Cloud is a place where there's a whole lot of information. But it does us no good if, in fact, I can't get to that information quickly. So with 5G, one of the advantages to 5G is you can do 5G slicing. So on one pipe, 
you can slice to 5G and you can get unclassed, classified, and TS or even above all in the same pipe. You won't need separate systems to feed, to feed the information out to the edge because what, what she was alluding to is if you think about it from a defense and uniform perspective, what commander would sit here and say, I don't want more information fast. We all want more information fast and we want it at the edge. The difference is now we have to think about who at the edge is getting this information and we may have to think about how we change our tactics a little bit to determine who has authority to shoot and act upon that information. But we also got partnerships with IBM utilizing things like Watson uh, and artificial intelligence. Because you can't really get, in my, my opinion, I don't think you really can get to artificial intelligence without a 5G sort of backbone because it's going to require too much data too much and too, too much speeds and 4G LTE can't, can't get you there. It can get you there in an isolated kind of spotty kind of place, but if you want true 5G, I mean uh, f true artificial intelligence, you're going to need the speed and the bandwidth that uh, something like a 5G or 6G will, will provide you. So. Now, if anybody wants to ask questions, get to the, there's somebody there. Go ahead, sir. Thanks, sir. Uh, my question relates to the application of cybersecurity operations within uh, the Western legal structure as it relates to international adversaries. So where this comes in is we're defending, let's say, an organization, whether it's public or private. We're running the operation. We're facing an adversary from Russia or from China, sometimes Iran. Because those criminal organizations are either former intelligence or military intelligence or associated with military intelligence or in some APTs they are directly embedded within them, we deal with a structure where the state is providing direct support, command and control, financial personnel, and they're operating with SOPs that are outside of our protective norms legally. So within, for example, in the Canadian instance, we have the Charter of Rights, which protects the privacy of our citizens and anything impacting a Canadian environment. Anyone who's worked in the SIGINT world, where I came from before, knows about our mandate C's and, and the FISA rules and everything we have to deal with. The same application is in the cyber world. So how do we, as Western cyber players, try and protect our environments, how do we figure out to set up an, a structure and operational procedures that allow us to still maintain success against our adversaries who are playing fundamentally on different rule sets than we are. Because I believe that the rule of law, at least in Canada, is substantially far behind compared to the rate of development in the cyber industry. What do you recommend we do? Whoever wants to pick that up. Well, uh, if I may, I think I will, I will take a step. Sure. Um, policies is usually dragging behind, way behind, painfully behind. And so I do understand and really echo your pain. Um, this is why I talk about you know, security is not a individual you know, play. It really has to be a team sports. And I think there is limitation and challenge like that, that what you just described. It really is across the different you know, boundaries, logical boundary either is limited by the nation, you know, national boundary or is by the corporation boundary. We run, we run into situation like that a lot. And this is why it is critically important that we rely on the, the national level to provide that clear back in and guidance to allow us and we can lean on them to solve those problem for us as proactively as possible. Unfortunately, the you know, advanced persistence threat pop up so quickly that we have a hard time trying to go, you know, to, to put the policy ahead of that. Having said that, I think, you know, really great uh, uh, advancement in terms of institutionalized, the, I call it adequate levels of policies at the national level, even in the global level. I also am delighted to see that we have more of the so-called, you know, worldwide uh, regulation now become effective, even though some of the effect, those regulations may appear to be very convolusive. 
one of the area for cybersecurity is really complex. So for example, GDPR, right? And then in California with CCPA and there are other different type of so-called healthcare privacy protection regulations. It is great to have regulation, but it's really difficult to execute and really become a good, effective, punitive action. And so what you're saying here is, I think the key here is really understanding your threat index, knowing where your threat trends are, and then be proactive and negotiate that you know, clarity on the boundaries. And especially if you are involved in, even in the you know, um, offensive side of the house, that's even more complicated. So I would encourage you to really kind of look at the proactive prediction side. I think that's the only way you're going to be able to catch up. Otherwise, we're always in a reactive mode. Okay, we have a question from this gentleman over here. Soldier, um, we've talked a lot about protecting data, but uh, thinking about infrastructure, we have to go back to some aging infrastructure, which is vital to everyday society. I think of uh, the electric power grid. There are only three power grids in North America. Any one of them, if you took it down, would be disastrous. Um, the railway systems, uh, air traffic control systems, and finally, um, the internet backbone itself. All of these are, are things that could be made uh, unusable, I think fairly easily with a coordinated cyber attack. But how do we, they are, they're all internet based nowadays, but they're all kind of old and clunky and they have a lot of holes and they're getting rusty. Um, it is probably child's play or something close to it to attack any one, uh, successfully attack any one of those systems. What are we going to do about that? Who wants to so, take that one on? So, the legend, how you doing, sir? Uh, I got to meet the legend this morning. Um, so, so it, and it's actually probably scarier than you think, right? Because it's not just critical. And first of all, first, we have to identify we don't even have a real understanding of all our single points of failure in our critical infrastructure. So we're in the process now of trying to get our arms around that. And the, uh, and the vulnerabilities with old legacy systems are not just outside in the industry and progress, but it's also in DOD and, and government uh, systems as well. A lot of our manpower systems are still using Fortran and Cobalt-based systems. Stuff I learned in college when I had key, key punch cards. You remember when you had to go, a lot of the young folks like key punch cards. Yeah, so, so it's even scarier. So, so first we gotta identify the critical infrastructure, the single points of failure. We know power plants, we know water treatment plants, we know banking systems, we know these kind of things. Banking systems though, by the way, are pretty, pretty far ahead because uh, they have to be. Um, but again, it's even, if you think about each state and how many power companies are in each state, and then what, what system do I got to get into to just shut off one piece of power or one power grid? And, it, and I got to identify what that single point of failure is. I, I mean, I don't even really know what that is. I mean, we're still trying to get our arms around that. So, so great point. The good part is that uh, uh, DOD government led by DHS for us is looking at that now, and then in, uh, in, in industry. So the power plants have a vested interest in, oh, by the way, upgrading their stuff too. You know, if I'm gonna be paying, you know, if I'm gonna be paying Comcast $260 a month so I can watch movies, I want them to make sure that this stuff's secure. It's not getting on my smart TV and logging into my other stuff and stealing all my bank account information. So uh, we got a whole, so industry is also looking at being able to upgrade the systems and identify this stuff too. So. We're about to wrap up, but I have one more question for you, Mr. Shepard, because um, I I'm, I'm mean, perhaps you can shed a little light on what uh, your former, your, your U.S. Defense Secretary said at the Munich Security Summit a month ago when he said that the United States is testing 5G alternatives at U.S. military bases. Um, can you shed any light on what he's so, so right now, Samsung, we're doing a couple, uh, we're working a couple pilot programs, uh, with, one with the Air Force and one with the Navy. Uh, we're just waiting for the funding lines to come through. Um, 
Um, and of course, we have to wait for the funding lines to come through before you can do a pilot. <laughs> um, so we're doing something with the with Nellis Air Force Base out at uh, with the Joint Strike Fighter, right? Joint Strike Fighter, Joint Strike Fighter is a cyber aircraft. I mean, it takes off and it lands. It's got so much data on it and all these sensors and all this stuff. How do you get that information off the jet fast? And if I got to wait till the jet lands hook up a cable to it and download all the information, then the Joint Strike Fighter, well, that's sort of missing the point of having a Joint Strike Fighter, right? And having access to all that information, all those sensors. So we're doing a pilot now to figure out how we can get utilizing 5G and get that information off the airplane a little faster. We're also looking at, uh, with the Navy, uh, bringing 5G to one of the piers. Because right now, a ship comes in from sea, we hook all these cables up to it, and I won't even tell you how many cables we hook up to this ship. But it's a lot of cables we hook up to the ship, and we're in 24 hours later, we're downloading all this information off the carrier, logistics, pay, all these things. And 24 hours later, we got it all set. And on the, on the pier, it's just covered with all these cables and ropes and all kind of stuff. So, so we're looking at doing a pilot where we set up a 5G backbone utilize, utilizing something like Wi-Fi 6 and seeing how fast we can then download information off the, off the carrier. And, I, I'm, and I'm convinced that we can do it considerably faster than cable. Oh, and by the way, we don't have to hook up all these cables to the, uh, to the ship to get it all off. So that's a couple of things that we're working at Samsung. But I'm also sure that you know, all the other folks that are doing stuff uh, with uh, IBM probably doing some things with the government. And we're, we're testing everybody. Okay. Well, look, um, thank the panelists. I hope uh, the audience found it informative, and thanks for inviting me to moderate. Appreciate it. So you guys know that my background is with Hegel and dialectics. So I just love the fact that I was hearing about we're going to build trust through zero trust infrastructure. That blew my mind. Love it. Um, all right. So we're moving into a short coffee break. We've got 15 minutes. Keep in mind that um, our good friend Peter Singer has a flight to catch. So every minute that we're running late today will be a minute fewer of enjoyment of the conversation he's going to have with Leah West later today. So let's take 15 and we'll start again at 245.